Yeah, so the, so the 19 months olds will, will do that. I mean, you can be in a room and uh, they, it's, you know, it's like, you know, pass pointing or uh, they don't want, so 19 month olds don't just want to point and, and I want that object or person. They actually want the mother because they, they've had a relationship with the mother and they want the mother to notice what they're noticing. Those are two different things. That's big because that's a, that's a social skill. We look for that in the office, right? So anyway, so it looks back and forth. Look at the baby, baby crying, baby crying. Yes, said Tracy, the baby is sad. What is she doing? She's putting what to her feelings? Words. You think the 19-month-old gets the, the whole concept of words to feelings? No, I mean, he's just learning, right, that the baby is sad. Now, it gets even better. The baby keeps wa kept wailing, and Cole asks, baby okay? Baby okay? Why is he doing that? His mommy is trying to help him calm down, Tracy explained. All really good things. She's even interpreting mom's behavior. Cole was looking for help making sense of the experience. His mother was attentive and gave Cole words for the baby's feelings and by extension for his own feelings. What's Right now, she's what? Training a husband and a father. I don't know if you've ever heard, uh, when, uh, when you don't train your children, you're going to be training your grandchildren. So how many parents, inner cities, all kinds of places, I don't know how many times, I, right? We've seen grandmas bring their, the kids, it's not the mom because, you know, mom's distanced or dismissive. So these words, or soul words, are the first step in describing his feelings. So at 19 months, so here's a really big deal right here. Cole was already able to see the needs of those around him. This indicates Cole's needs had been recognized, welcomed, and attended to many times. You know that because he's pointing at, what about them? What about them? He could give because he had received. He was responsive because his parents had responded to him. And someday, when Cole marries, he'll notice when his wife is upset and say, wifey okay? Wifey okay? And she will love his sensitivity. That's not the only skill he needs, but you know he needs it, right? All right, I didn't, not only did I have feelings, Cheryl didn't either. Cheryl didn't have feelings, and Hannah didn't have feelings, and neither did Stephen or George or Samuel or Abigail or Phoebe or Simon. So at 19 months, oh, sorry. In our marriages, it's difficult to give something we never got. Did you have parents who were compassionate and tuned into your feelings? If not, could that be why you and your spouse have difficulty responding to each other? So I know the words are a little small, but this is kind of, uh, I wanted one imprint pattern up. That's the only one we're going to see, and that's a secure one. We won't go through the five abnormal ones. And, uh, you know, the avoider, uh, the uh, pleaser, uh, the vacillator, the controller, and the victim. Those are the other five. But this is the one good one. So the child's needs are recognized, welcomed, and seen. The child's expression is the whole spectrum. He's sad, or he's angry, or uh, ch the child learns to feel and deal with his or her emotions. We'll actually talk about feeling and dealing in a second. It sounds sounds kind of like shady when you use the word deal, but you'll see what I'm talking about. And the parent is able to, to give the child's needs uh, and give them appropriate responses, offer comfort, and what is the reaction? The child feels loved, accepted. Uh, validated. This, this brings relief, trust, and respect. And uh, we'll talk about some of that here coming up. 
Uh, responding to children's unique traits and taking time to interact with them, which brings pleasure and relief. This is the only part of this whole presentation we're actually talking about uh, children. Mm -hmm. So sensitive parents know and understand their children, and children feel known and understood. Why is that important, right? It's always about, okay, what, how do you know what they know? How are they known, and what do they understand? They have an ability to trust as parents are consistent in meeting their needs. They're respectful then as adults, because they ter take turns in marriage. And they learn to put feelings to words or else will act out as adults. You know, who's Carla? Uh, it's just a brief story. So Carla grew up in a home where her parents were very strict. Okay? And I don't think I can find that story, but the, the, her, her parents were very strict. Well, what does, she, what does she know about feelings at that point? She is not allowed to have any. And as a matter of fact, she obeys, her. she's learned, and the parents are actually proud of it. The, the child has learned to obey right away, which I'm not, I'm not saying anything about obedience, but we, we know obedience is not the main part of life. It is that they need to learn how to love God with all their heart. Well, that begins with loving their, their parents. So what does, what does Carla do? Now, she's not scarred you know, to where she's robbing banks or anything like that. No, but she's in a marriage now. So her husband says, lights on but nobody's home. I mean, that's a terrible thing. I, I don't have the, the, the story. And what do I mean by that? Lights on, nobody's home. She doesn't know how to make a decision. She's never had to. Right? She just does what she's told. Okay? It's very different to get into an environment where then as a husband, he has to be aware of that. He has to know how to help her, to, get, to take her back and help her through life itself. Because emotionally, she's never grown up to where she understands a feeling. Like, she could be angry. She doesn't, even once she gets angry, she doesn't even know what to do with it, right? So we have to do all that. So parents who properly handle a child's fear, shame, anger, sadness, and jealousy, and teaching them to process emotion rather than eliminate uncomfortable feelings, like, don't be sad. Don't be mad. You know the parents aren't like that. But those are the same parents that tell their kids not to do that. So parents who properly handle a child's fear, shame, anger, sadness, jealousy. Oh, sorry. Parents who develop secure connections, honor and respect children's feelings. I never respected my children's feelings. I never respected my wife's feelings. I do now. And teaching them to manage. What's that feeling and dealing concept? Well, how to deal with your feelings. In other words, you're feeling something, and how, how is it, uh, is this working out? All right. Here's Susie's little story. She had a fit. Mom told uh, Susie, who's six years old, that after a 10-minute warning, that it's time for your friends to go home. So Susie first ignores her mom, right? It's okay. Uh, but that's what 10 year olds, six year olds do. And when mom begins to show her friends to the door, Susie throws a, a tantrum, a fit. After the, after the friends leave, the lesson begins. Now mom could say, this is a good mom, she's explaining some things, and she, you know, if it ever needed to go to correction, she would do it. I went to, I went to judgment first. And Cheryl always went to, to I mean, even to this day, kids, our kids talk to her, and uh, I mean, they talk to me too, but it's like a whole different relationship she's had with them over two and three decades. And uh, so this is the advantage here. You, so now mom could say how, she could say, how dare you throw a fit in front of your friends? No playmates for the rest of the week. Or mom could say, you should be grateful that I allow your friends over to, over to play. But instead, you act like a brat. Don't you ever do that again. Or don't you ever do that again. 
But instead, this wise and healthy mom says, healthy in which way? Maybe she's physically healthy, but what other way is she healthy? I want to use the word emotional, and I know this is, the, remember I told you, some stuff today, this afternoon is going to be, it's still coming. There's more coming. I'm going to say spiritually. They're very related. I was a spiritually active man, active, not mature, but emotionally backward. I did that successfully in a group setting of people just like me. Well, the guys. That's the, that's the fact of it. And so, uh, so she, here she says, uh, instead, I see you're angry and sad because playtime is over and you wanted to play more. It's okay to feel mad when playtime ends, right? I mean, she, but what does she do with that? But you need to learn to control your emotions and express them in good ways. You can also, at that point, just pray with the child. Just let them know. That's what she, Cheryl does, did, and still does, <laughs> you know. And uh, and you and this is how you how you get back from, you know, the six negative emotions. We may end up talking about that later. That's that's the last part. Uh, and come back to joy. How do you do that? I know you really like your friends. She's validating her feelings, right? I know you like your friends, and you're not happy that they have to leave. But a tantrum is not the right way to handle your frustration. You need to sit here quietly until you're ready to talk about it. That's better than giving them an ultimatum and sending them to their room until they come out with a smile. That's hard for some of us to hear. I, and again, I'm not trying to parent your children, but just take a look at what we're doing with this. So reactive statements would demand that Susie get rid of her feelings. By demonstrating understanding, Susie will know mom cares about her feelings when mom sets limits. And when mom accepts and respects Susie's feelings beneath the tantrum, mom lets her know that her emotions are both understandable and controllable. We'll leave it at that. So children raised in homes like Susie's learn through their experiences to have good listening skills, and to draw out the opinions and feelings of others. That's what the mom is doing with her. She's drawing, she, she can, she's modeling that. As adults, they are open, vulnerable, same thing as transparent, and comfortable with disclosure. They have interpersonal skills and are able to negotiate mutually satisfying solutions to problems, which is very different in a home where one person uh, you know, kind of, kind of, everybody walks on eggshells around them. It doesn't have to be only that kind of home, but, but it's very different. Parents who do not feel and deal their own emotions grow up their children as caretakers. You've probably heard that before. If you haven't, that's what, so it's all about mommy coming home. Let's say she came home from a, a difficult day at work or some project and she wants to play with the child. The child may not be ready. The baby may not be ready uh, to play and just to enjoy time, but mom is. So at that point, the, we're on mom's schedule. There's no synchrony. That's another word from the third section. That, so they don't realize that their own feelings are important. So, so kids grow up as caretakers of their parents because their parents are having feelings. They never dealt with them in their past. Now they're living that same life again through this. All right, uh, some helpful things maybe. Parents who miss quiet time uh, do not refill their tank. You know, it's like time to pray, have a, a time of devotions, stop, think, uh, it's not stop, think, and roll. That's for fun. <laughs> but anyway, it's stop and think. <laughs> so 
parents who synchronize with children, that word synchronize is big. I don't know how much I emphasize it in that last section, but it's, it's very big. That's hard. Children are not only there, you know, they're, they're there but not seen. They don't get synchronized. You don't synchronize with them. It's not all about them, right? It's not all about you either. <laughs> right? It was all about me. I know this by experience. I'm telling you, I was the one on top of the, the, the food chain. And anybody weaker than me was going to get eaten. And I, I've done this at church. I've run over people to get a project done. So synchronize with children regarding the balance of dependence and independence. Because there are times we know, uh, no, I, I want to do this. You know, and sometimes they need help. And it's okay to have both. Uh, parents who learn to receive, okay, there's two, two parts of this. They're aware of feelings and needs of others, and they also learn to give. They're aware and communicate their feelings. Children who, who, are, uh, who learn to accept, supposed to be learn, to accept good and bad, uh, and they're secure with limitations and disappointments. You know what I didn't know how to do? I didn't know how to have a disappointment. I wasn't going to have it. You know that's not true, but do you think I couldn't emotionally go through that? And again, that's a spirit. That's part of the spiritual life. We just we just do this and uh, and do that uh, very too easily, especially uh, in Christian work where activity is very important. Children who know how to wait, uh, they have a, the, the idea of balancing wanting with waiting and receiving with giving. You know, these are all really good skills. Uh, secure uh, connectors know how to say no. I, I never knew how to say no. I wanted to be pleasing to, I mean, it, it just all ended up on my plate. I'm not, that's not my core imprint anyway. It's not pleaser. But that's just one of the one of the things. Uh, I stayed busy. You know, that's one one of the things. I don't have to think about all this. And uh, they're confident of their abilities, and they're not frightened or overwhelmed by change. I'm always frightened by change. Right? I'm able to ask for help. I'm secure yet able to depend on others. I never ask for help. I mean, I don't know, a thousand times, probably it's not a thousand, at the hospital or wherever, if I'm learning something, you know. Of course, I know everything, right? I don't learn anything. I know everything already. I'm not going to let anybody know I'm actually in learning mode. And if at all they say to me, you know, please come and ask, uh, if you need anything. I've never asked anybody for anything. Ever in my life. I'm, I'm thinking that. You know. And I, I just don't. I mean that's. Uh, and, and what happens. If you come and ask me for help. When I already know. You should be able to figure that out. Watch out. Right. Because I don't operate that way. I'm a self starter. Why can't you be? But there are times when people are not self starters. I need to know, this is coming up in st step four, as a strong protector. You have three kinds of people in a local church there are protectors, predators, and possums. The protectors really are supposed to be part of the elders that. Pastor and elders are supposed to be strong protectors. They're not supposed to be going after people who don't know how to behave or they're emotionally, you know, immature. And uh, keep them away. You know, it's a lot easier. Let me get around me the people that are already, they're all set up and ready to go. And I can work with them, right? So, uh, do not avoid 
strong, secure connectors do not avoid or ignore problems and conflicts. And they're able to admit mistakes, I can't, and apologize for errors. I, again, I'm saying the core, you know, the way I grew up. Don't worry about this, okay? <laughs> all right, what, let's think about wounds again. All right, do you remember the, the setup? The, the insecure uh, attachments create wounds. So who creates them? Let's talk about some of this. Wounds are not sins. They are due to dysfunctional attachment and insecure connections. I don't want them to be just words. Again, uh, I want us to see the whole forest. I mean, uh, see the trees and concentrate when we're supposed to, and but still get the whole picture. Because in a marriage relationship, we have all of these things from the past that are coming in and affecting it. So our sin is attempting, this is actually where our sin is, is to be good enough or get life right on our own. And my wife mentioned that uh, when she presented. We often use, here they are, and Gerald mentioned this, use protective layers or false cells. For example, Adam and Eve, they're sowing their fig leaves and hiding from God among the trees of the garden, right? We're sitting here looking at the screen and we're thinking, what in the world were they thinking, right? God created them. He knows everything. He knows every intimate part of them. He's heard everything, seen everything. And they put fig leaves on, and they go hide. And, and you know, the young person would say, go figure, right? <laughs> but that's us, right? We do that. We just have to remember that... We, we do the same thing. So how do we create wounds? Remember this diagram. This doesn't answer the question, but I wanted us to keep remembering it. Insecure attachment, some wounds and imprints, and then there's a flood of feelings, and then on to the next generation. So this is Don and Becky Smith. We met them in... Uh, uh, you will see them. You, you're going to get. You're going to get to see a whole video, Lord willing, and hear it too. <laughs> that uh, you're going to definitely see the video, and hear it hopefully. That Don and Becky say some things to each other. So I didn't throw a picture up there. So they do the Bridge to Life uh, uh, ministry. It's a counseling and teaching ministry. We met them in the July of 2016 during a teachers workshop, and their book is the Heart and Soul of a Real Marriage. It's a 12-week lesson book, which encompasses marriage and, and issues. And they also have, I have an example of both of them. The, the Master Craftsman book discusses concepts of maturity from boy to man, to husband to father, and then to patriarch. And that patriarch is one who has consistently yielded himself for the good of his family and church community. And I'm telling you what, my life changed when I heard that now, I know, I've said that already a bunch of times. Okay? It isn't the same kind of change that happened in 2000. Why did it change when I heard that? Take a look at our culture and in our local churches. We have no idea how to actually move in maturity. What kind of maturity would that be? It's actually the giving of myself even for even to stay with and be relational with the people who are facing the consequences of their own actions. Dr. Champlin taught me this amazing principle. And that is that he would stay with his people even when they were in trouble from their own doing. Because to reject them at that point is never to teach them anything. You say, well, they're going to get the, they're going to learn from the, from, the, from the consequences of their own bad actions. And we kind of give it to them that way. And in fact, we call it the school of hard knocks. And yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of a marine way to do it. I mean, I guess we, do, we could do that. But a home and relationships and local church is not the marine boot camp. Maybe it'll work in, in a marine boot camp, although that's gotten some people into trouble here recently. I don't know if you heard that. So uh, this, this whole thing 
to go from boy to man to husband to father and to patriarch. I know of very few patriarchs. I mean, we're talking, I can count them on one hand. I'm not even sure I can reach five. I went to the, the memorial service for, for a man who I believe truly was a patriarch. I went looking on the internet for examples of patriarchs. I'm not going to go through all that, but they are the strong protectors in a community. Why? Because they're so powerful and somebody puts them on a pedestal and puts a crown on their head? No, it's never. See, that's how it works. It's never about them. It's all about who they are growing up in that community. That's, that's the beauty of it. The, this song, this theme is so intense in my mind now, you know, that I look for it everywhere. You know, it's like a new word. All right. Wolves. I know you don't see that word up there. W-O, wounds, lies, and vows. So some people call that wolves. That's a pattern. You have to get used to this. So I got a story. I, you're, you're surprised, I know. You're just surprised. All right. When we heard Don and Becky tell the story, I started crying. Of course, you probably figured I would. But it was like unbelievable. Like our, our, our hearts were with her. So Becky, I, so I wish... You know, I could remember it like I'm supposed to, but this is the best I got. When she was a young girl in second grade, so maybe seven or eight years old, she was in a family of meager means, so didn't have many extra things. She grew up relishing special occasions, and including awards assemblies at school. And during one of those events, she wanted so much to receive an award that she thought she heard her name. So let me explain that little piece of it. So this was not hearing her name and then you go back and sit down. What they did was they brought everybody up here and lined them all up and then the person would say, so and so come and get your award. Does that make sense? So she went up there with all the other kids that she that heard their names and she thought uh, she heard her name so she went up with the other kids the school was in the habit oh i already explained that as many of the kids were getting their awards she became a little nervous that her name was not called and at this point the the boy next to her said you fool that's how she said it so i'm saying it to you like that you fool there's no award up there for you she was so disappointed and embarrassed. Even as she told the story, at least a few of us had some tears, as she now explains from that wound she believed, wound, she believed the lie. What's the lie that she believes at that point? I am a fool. We can't kid ourselves that that doesn't happen even more often. This is just, you know, seven or eight years old, she's in a, you know, she'll get through this, right? Look at what it did with, to her though, right? This is the Don and Becky that put all this stuff together with, okay? So, you know, so, so I'm a fool then from which she vowed, wounds, lies, vows. I'll never do that ever again. And how did she translate that in her life? Years later, as her husband explained, now her husband, I think, took over when he was explaining this, they began Bridge to Life Ministries. Yeah, they've had that for 30 plus years now. He wanted her to teach with her, and she always declined or refused each time, stating, I'll take care of the kids. You do the work of the ministry. However, the real reason, as she finally admitted to her spouse, to Don was this event from second grade, which had bound her due to a lie. When she was able to accept the identity that Jesus gave her, she was free to teach and minister with her husband. And you'll see, oh, you were, if you remember that story, when you hear her, uh, you know, hopefully you'll hear her, because it's, everything is about seeing and hearing that, that film. 
if we can do it. And that is, you'll, you'll put that together and you think, oh, wow. Because the way she's being used now. She was such an integral part of, uh, of, the, of the learning that uh, we had that week. Uh, so a child, oh, here's the, here's the concept now. This is the only slide where I actually call something a wound and like, what is it? So a child is not able to process they're not being loved well. I know I just said something, but that's really big. They don't know. In fact, most of the adults around that family may not even know how a child is to be loved. But surely the child doesn't know. The only thing the child knows is they, don't, they do not see failures of parents or others. They meet to meet the need for unconditional acceptance and value. They're not saying to themselves, writing their diary, Dad, Dad didn't love me unconditionally today. What do they do? They assume something is wrong with them, thinking they are defective. Those are wounds. Okay. A child develops an inner sense of fear, shame, and feelings of being alone, which all are painful, and then they develop lies about their identity. We'll look at a few lies, but you, you know what's going on now. Consciously or unconsciously, they make vows from these lies. Examples of some lies. I'm a bad person. I'm not competent. I don't have what it takes. I can never get it right. I am unlovable. I will always be damaged goods. I'm a failure. Now, what's interesting is these are wounds from the past. And it rears up in the present as a, oftentimes as a flood of feelings. Right? You know you hit something when you say something and the other person isn't just kind of reacting like you know, what you kind of think, but it's like something big just happened and you don't even know what it is. And, and that's, those, are, those are where the lies and vows uh, affect us. I will never trust anyone again. I, I personally, my, I don't trust anybody. Remember now, the core part of me is I don't trust anybody. I don't trust, you know. And then I always have people around me that uh, reinforce that. I mean, my boss, when he hired me, and he had no problems with me doing this, right? In medicine, you can't trust too many people. You have to be careful, <laughs> and, uh, right? And because, uh, you, you know, somebody says, yeah, the test was normal. I, I always check myself, and uh, every, every one of my teachers always told me. So my boss, you know, as soon as I got hired, like 13 years ago, he says, don't trust anybody, and, uh, and, and only trust your grandmother on Tuesdays. And, I mean, he was, he was like that, and he's still like that, and uh, so I know that's medicine, but, but the sense of trust that you have in people I will never take a risk. That's me. I don't take risks because I don't want to fail. <sighs> what are you shaking your head for? <laughs> That's right. I will never take a risk. I will never let anyone close to me. That's me. I must always make others happy. And that's not me, but, you know. I will protect myself at all costs. My reputation. I must earn your approval. That would be like, it's always victim mode, the possum mode. I need to earn your approval. I must avoid failure at all costs. And I must keep busy. These are vows that are made. That doesn't mean if you're always busy that you made a vow, right? You're okay with that? Uh, but there may be times when it's very much related to a major thing. We not only have childhood wounds, okay, now here's another great big point, okay? So we come into marriage with wounds and imprints, but as adults, we create many wounds within our closest relationships, namely our spouses, our marriages. 
And uh, I didn't put this quote in there. It goes something like this. There's nothing like marriage to hone in and focus in the spotlight on those wounds from the past. Like <laughs> Mylon and Kay, right? Their kids brought out every weakness that they never even thought they had. We have a flood of feelings from early imprints and can learn to recognize these. But adult wounds are not created by offenses. Right? You can offend somebody and you can move through that, right? But this is adult wounds are developed over a period of months. And but it's oftentimes it's years. So imagine being married for 20 years, 15 years, 30 years, right? Four, four decades. I use an analogy for skin, skin wounds. Uh, we're not going to uh, talk about skin wounds today, but skin wounds don't start in a hurry. By the way, there's a whole bunch of them now in people because we have more diabetes and obesity and inactivity. When people don't move and then they, as they get older, they move even less, they sit, and you always create a, a skin wound when you have skin right on top of bone, right? So that's where the pressure point is. It, you know, they're often called pressure wounds, okay? Or sometimes you'll hear the word decubitus ulcer. So these skin wounds don't start overnight. Whoa, are they hard to heal. I mean, it takes forever. Then you get bone infections as a result and all of that. What a complication. And so in, we don't create as adults just, just by simple offenses, but over a period of years, it takes, uh, it takes to actually um, uh, to create these. So why should we look at the wounds we have caused our partner? Why can't we just say, I'm sorry, and leave it at that? Wow. Okay? You're going to, I'm really hoping we get to see our, and hear our videos. I am telling you, it changes the bar completely when you hear Don and Becky reading letters to each other. Like, you're going to walk away and you're going to think, forget it. That's not me. Or you're just going to love it. It's going to be one or the other, because it is so powerful, right? It's like a light shining in here that's so powerful. You're either going to be blinded or you're not, but there's not going to be an in-between. It's that powerful. So these are, th we might say, these are just things in the past. Why are you bringing them up? And so we have the story of King David's sin, right? Oh, I've heard sermons, not that many of them, where it it shows David's sin and the sins in his... How many children did he bury? He buried three sons, I think, right? But he was willing to listen. But it's interesting. Uh, there's still protective layers or false selves in this. Uh, actually, we get to David's... Uh, uh, story in a different slide, actually, but I might as well just uh, mention it here. Uh, no, I'll, I'll do it when, when we get to it. Uh, one relationship in marriage I wanted to make sure we understood, and uh, this is another aspect of our afternoon, uh, that uh, Don and Becky have pooled resources to come up with some of their materials. So this isn't... Uh, original material with them. But uh, they talk about the husband as a vassal king who has, what's a vassal king? You know, you've got the main king and then you've got all these provinces. And so the, the vassal king is the king over that particular province. And so he moves into the marriage with leadership initiative. The wife is, this is big. I, I never heard anything like this before, to be honest with you. Uh, but I have, I have seen it. How many, how many times, if you ever knock on doors, or uh, if you talk to anybody, husband, wife, about the Lord, uh, you, you'll knock on a door, 
and the guy comes to the door, and you say, Ann Arbor Baptist Church, you know, we're from Ann Arbor Baptist Church, and we'd just like to uh, leave a, a track and ask you a question, if I could. And, and he says, oh, just a minute. Guess who he goes and gets and sends to the door? You're a guy, you just, right. You're a guy, you just knocked on his door, and because she ho she's the holder of all religion and relationships in the house, he goes and gets her. Now, he doesn't stay with her. What's up with that? I don't think so, right? Is what he's thinking. I'm going to go do my, you know, I'm going to sit and watch, or I'm going to eat, or whatever. But she is a lifesaver. She actually is a warrior for the relationship. This is big. Why? Because many ladies don't know. I, I consider my wife a warrior for the relationship uh, that, that we had. And in large part, I, I fully believe, uh, other than the champions, I don't know who else would have been praying that hard for things, for things to happen in, in our home. That's the encouragement that I was telling you about for wives uh, and mothers is to be that warrior. Now, that doesn't mean you put your armor on and walk into the marriage. I'm a new lady. Watch out, because I just went to this marriage seminar. No, that's the last thing we need, right? This is all under Holy Spirit direction. And don't just take away stuff. I'm giving you a lot of stuff today. And you're going to have to put it in the in the crucible of the things that God is, the trials he's giving you right now, like I would have to. And, but I want to be an encourager and say that she is the warrior for the relationship. She, she does that. Husbands struggle with confidence and perseverance, right? We heard some of that right here, even as we did the false selves. And women experience pain in the relationship. That's part of the curse. Even though she wants it so much, she, she, she can't, there's going to be pain there. The husband is to be aware of the struggle with the curse and specifically relationships, even though he's not the, the one that holds the relationship. We always think he's the protector. Well, yeah, he's the protector, but he's, he doesn't protect the, the relationship in that home. There's a tenderness to that that, that, the, that the lady does you know, hands down, better than that husband. He used to be aware of the struggle with the curse, but specifically of relationships. He moves toward his wife to lead and impact her life and their relationship, not just in good times. You know, of course, you know, when they meet and, and uh, as they date, you know, and, uh, you know, it's just like my wife and I. You know, things change after, after you get married and you get to be there all the time and and you want to impact her life, and you want to impact the relationship with her. All right. And you stay on the highway of strength and tenderness. We'll uh, explain that analogy. So they always talk about, uh, Don and Becky do, about the highway, and then going to the highway, going to either side is a ditch, right? So they, what they, their language of the false self is the idea of living out of the ditch. They don't stay on the highway of strength and tenderness. They will not resort to the ditch of, that's what a husband ought to do, avoidance or overcompensating. That's the two sides. We'll just look at what those are. And a good husband, actually, who is emotionally mature, he's aware of the vows that keep him in the ditch. Here's the ditch of avoidance, just being passive, fearful, unassertive, avoids conflict. You know, that might be a fascinating thing, right? Because typically, like when he gets out with the guys or something, hey, how, how are things going? I mean, you know, of course, nobody's asking how the relationship is going. But, you know, he might be all proud that, you know, eh, we haven't had a fight in, I don't know, 10 years or something like that, he might say. And so he's doing a good job. He's avoiding conflict. He pouts. He's apologetic, or overly so. We're not talking about the apologies, that, right? Just being inoffensive. 
unobtrusive. Here's the overcompensating side, right? So you can see how this works. He's angry, threatening, abrasive, demanding, violent, bullying, provoking, and intense. Here's the wife's side. She's aware of the deep struggle to preserve the relationship. And that helps. That's a comfort to her. She needs to understand that. And moves toward her husband and offers relationship. Stays on the highway of strength and tenderness herself. What are her ditches like? Here's how she avoids. She's nice. She's a doormat. A victim. A fake. She's sweet. I often wonder about sweet wives, which is just perfectly fine to be sweet, but I wonder if they grew up either in a home or they're in a relationship where, that doesn't mean you know she just has to speak her mind all the time and things like that, but to always, let's make sure that it's the spirit-filled kind of sweetness. It uh, avoids conflict and it's too trusting and she hides, just the opposite. Here's a lady who takes charge because she wants to be controlling in the relationship and she doesn't want to hurt like she hurt years ago with her dad. So there's anger there, harshness, clamoring, controlling, opinionated, do dominating. And uh, Becky's word powers up. You know, you have, because she's not naturally this way. And she, you know what I mean by power up? You have to. You have to, you got to get revved up to do this. Now, a husband wounding his wife. Look at that one. Not pursuing his wife emotionally. That's a different level. To actually pursue our wives emotionally is, the, is part of the journey of intimacy. Avoiding conflicts with his wife. Again, right? That's, that seems almost intuitively like, what does that mean? But uh, it really means that we're hurting, wounding here when we avoid conflict with our wives because we're not dealing with the realities of things. I'm good at that, actually. Value work, ministry, sports, hobby above our wife. And being negative and critical, comparing a wife to another woman, to other women, not to another woman. That would be really bad. So shifting blame, not taking responsibility for failures. And shifting blame is, uh, I've had that done to me, I, not Cheryl, and, uh, but I remember it so well. I just like sat there because I presented something to somebody once uh, a little while back and, and they said something and I'll tell you what, uh, I know what that feels like, so I don't want to do that to somebody. So that doesn't mean I'll never do that to somebody, but I remember what it feels like. You know, it's just like, you know, I, I made it a point to just bring it up in the right way, in the right time, and everything. Oh, no. So harsh and demanding is what the uh, husband does. And he, he has anger just to be able to control. And how come we never talk about mutual submission? That's my other reason for damaging wives. I told you this afternoon we're going to come to some things. <laughs> and uh, so let's look at this. I never in a million years thought that was in the Bible. Do you know why? Because I never read. I did. But you know, reading and reading is two different things. Like you're, right? You know this. But ask me if I've ever heard in all the sermons in my whole life. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing it more now. You know, I know the truth now. Where is mutual submission taught? I, I can't imagine that, that no pastor's answer, please. So, yeah, exactly. Oh, he's, he's, a, he's a student. So uh, he's probably a secret uh, a devoted pastor or something. Huh? Ah, they, oh, see, you aren't supposed to answer. All right. So anyway, you know, pastors may understand this, but mutual submission in the home, Ephesians 5.21. Most often, submission is discussed in the context of wife to her husband. So, concept of mutual submission was a novel one for me. I had previously understood, but I never applied it to my marriage of soul liberty. What is that? But we don't coerce men 
to think or behave against their conscience. Just try that for once. Ooh. <laughs> that doesn't work. You know, unless you have an unusual man. But against their conscience, I realized my wife also needed that same right. That's not going to go over exactly the same with every, every man sitting here. I know that. But you got to think about it. Remember, I'm not here to change your life, but I want to at least make sure that the thinking, you're considering it. Do you understand? Are you understanding what I'm saying here? Within the context of her submission to her husband, okay? So within the, that context, she is a person, right? I mean, the, the Bible's filled with all kinds of stuff, but... For example, Sapphira, I, I did all the, you know, I'm, I'm negative. I'm always negative. And I got all the negative examples. There's positive examples. Uh, I'll mention one, but it's not in here. So Sapphira died with her husband. You ever wonder? I'm not even going through that story. And I said, Sapphira? Okay. So Achan's wife and children died with him. I don't think that was just lumping everybody together. God doesn't do stuff like that. Right? There's a purpose in this. And this is a, a real interesting one. Sarah herself received faith. And where is she honored? In the hall of faith of Hebrews 11. Nobody ever preaches on that. Well, very few people do. So I, this was big for me. So I just had to throw this in here. All right? I mean, I hear this all the time, and I can't, I can't make a big deal about it when I hear it, because I don't pull out my Bible and start teaching. We always hear that women are just responders. The way I think about responders, I don't know what you're thinking. When I think of responders, I press a button, and I, and, and I get my pop. I don't, drink, I don't drink pop, but that's kind of the analogy, right? I put in my quarter. And I get my, my uh, potato chips. Really? That's, that's what it is? And, he, and, and women are created in his image? Uh, I was going to have everybody read some of these verses. I'm just going to keep going, though. They're viewed as venerated partners and cherished companions, not slaves or possessions. The children are commanded to honor both father and mother. We're equal in Christ. I don't know if you know that verse in Galatians chapter 3. We're to be honored in the home by the husband. Honor them. We always jump right to weaker vessel. And we bypass the word honor. And they're noted as virtuous in, in Proverbs 31. Jesus' disciples included several women. The story of Jesus with Martha and Mary illustrates that women are to be at the feet of Jesus. In fact, what was Martha doing what most ladies do? She was serving the housework, uh, and everything about a lady is what Martha would normally be. But she would also know something about relationships. She had to, I don't know, through the through her past and whatever happened to her, we understand now that Mary understood the better part. That doesn't mean Jesus isn't saying don't do any work, right? But the, the love relationship that Mary showed is what God is looking for, even of the wife and lady in the home. Jesus respected the Samaritan woman. He spoke to her with respect. And that's why she got saved. She va Jesus validated the woman with issue of blood. You remember that story? And the, and the disciples, you know, said to him, he says, who, who touched me? In this big throng, somebody touches him. But that was clearly an act of faith that Jesus immediately recognizes. And, uh, the, the, you know, she's just a, a sick lady. She had an issue of blood, some type of hemorrhage somewhere. And, uh, and let's keep going, Jesus. But no, he validates who she is and heals her. He validated the woman with the alabaster box anointment. What a big sermon that could be in, in many, you know, 37 through 50.
Jesus restored the virtue and honor of the adulterous woman in John chapter 8. Responders? Mm, okay. Then we're not being biblical. Here's the wife damaging her husband, demanding a critical spirit, using anger or silence to resist intimacy, unresponsive emotionally and physically, failure um, to share vulnerably with her husband. Remember now, she is the... Um, she is the she is the lifesaver for that relationship, and of all the people, have you ever heard this analogy? Uh, when a lady falls, she falls very hard because she started higher. I always think of that. I remember who who, who told me that. Uh, in whatever manner she falls. I mean, it's not like we expect men to fall, but you know, it's much more common. It's just kind of the grunts of the family anyway, right? And, but I, let's change that image. They're not just the grunts, but the lady, like, so, you know, affairs and things like that, all that is difficult uh, to move through, but it's doable. So withholding her soul from her husband, the Homer children before the husband, which I didn't cover. It's not a main point in this thing, but the husband-wife relationship has to be uh, the, 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 the paragon of virtue in that home. You have to, to bring it up as the most important thing, even before, not the children don't matter, but we always want to go right to the children's needs, but in fact, it's a husband-wife relationship. So dwelling on his past failures and having to always be in control. All right, uh, we're coming close to a break, okay? So distance, oh, when we damage an offense, you know what we do? We move as quickly as possible from the point of damage. It's like an earthquake. We're out of there. Like the center of the earthquake, right? On the Richter scale, it's a seven, and it just, it, it we, we want to get out. Like if I was in an earthquake, the first thing I'd want to do, I'd find anybody that I wanted to take with me. I'm out of there. I do not want to look at the damage I have done to you. I am more concerned about myself. I want to go back to the forest just for a second. A lot of trees here. So in a marriage relationship, we come in with the insecure attachments. We are creating wounds, end up manifesting as feelings or just flood of feelings. But we also create wounds in our marriage. All we are going to do is add to all the damage from before. Maybe we just piggybacked on to, to dad's, to the father's uh, wounds, I mean, uh, father's uh, disconnect and the mother's disconnect. So that's where we are at in this presentation is when we damage and offend, what should we do? Should we just move away from this thing? I'm sorry. Okay? I'm sorry does not address the real problem. It does not open the door for healing and restoration. That's what we're looking for. And what's, what's, our, what's our phrase we've been using? It's the journey of intimacy. Almost done. We don't want to just manage the damage. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, that's just how it came out. We want to heal the wound. By the way, there are patients with skin wounds that they just, uh, it's so tiring. You know, somebody has to, change the dressing, and then they, oh, it's such a, oh, what a headache it is, right? And it just goes on for years. I know people who've had, you know, for like four or five years, they've had wounds. And uh, it's never healed because there's not good things that are, you know, you got to clean up all their health issues before that wound will heal. So we need to confess. And it means to say the same thing, right? Homo logeo. Homo same, logeo say, say the same thing, to understand from the offended one's perspective. That is a huge thing. In fact, you don't want to confess unless you are ready to 
understand it from the offended one's perspective. I want to feel my partner's pain as if it were my own. All that sounds like it's like from another planet, right? Like who lives this way? Well, there are some people that live that way, right? Yep. I want to know my partner's pain. Now look, this is the, the slide I was telling you. So God sent Nathan to David so he could hear a story. So sometimes, as a man or as a woman, but it's usually the guy, right? He does something, and he doesn't get it in what he did, but he will nail it if you give him an object lesson. And boy, he was just ready to go kill the guy who took the lamb, right? He could hear, uh, hear a story that allowed him to be in the offended one's shoes. And what did he do? He was, how did he react? He burned with anger against the man. He felt the hurt. So when we offend, how can we enter their pain if we're not willing to listen to their story? Hands down, if you're ever working with yourselves or another couple, if one hasn't heard the other one's story clearly, you'll have to hear, hear it in them. You'll have to hear it in their voice and in their, in, in, not only in where, what they're uh, saying with their words about their cognition, but also from their heart, that they, they got it. He, in fact, Don uses the concept of get it, I get it. And that's what he means by that. So entering their pain is not just asking forgiveness, rather it is embracing their hurt and allowing them to share how they really feel. You have to allow time for that. It takes time for that to happen. So repentant attitudes come as we feel our offenses through the eyes and emotions of our partner. This is, this is really big, right? So remember that the forest we're in is the marriage relationship. We don't want to create more wounds. We had some from our past, but we, want to, we don't want to create more. We must communicate through our spirit and attitude that we understand how deeply we have hurt them. And how do we do that? Our partner wants to see that we really get it by seeing a change in our attitude and actions, okay? Oh, relief, a uh, little break. One thing I wanted to tell you, so I, was, I showed these slides to Abigail on the way here, uh, and uh, I'm talking about my daughter, Abigail, and uh, most of you know her. She's a she, school teacher, and I'll just give you this quick, quick thing. So she said, just if I get it right, so she says when they do um, uh, conflict intervention or management in their, in their school, you know, one party has offended the other party kind of thing, and so the one who offends, okay, has to wait until the offended ones are ready to talk. Like you can't just show up at a meeting and, uh, and say, listen guys, I'm really sorry. What they do is they wait till the offended ones are are ready to talk, then they have the meeting. Then they come and the, and the offender then hears everybody's thought process. Now there you can't do all the spiritual stuff and have them, uh, you know, really get things like what we're talking about in a marriage. But you see that same principle? They have to see it through the eyes of the one who is offended. This is big when things happen in a home that children are validated about a series, decade, two decades, three decades. It's never too late. That's the other thing I want to tell you. And the reason I say this, we may not ever recognize the damage we've caused not only to our family, but to the name of Christ to the power of the Spirit of God, all of that's been handed to us. I'm not just trying to be politically correct and say all those things. That is huge because at the judgment seat of Christ, our children are going to benefit from a true apology. When we who have offended them 
can really recognize mom and dad got it, or da most of the time, you know, it's dad got it. He got it. And that's the thing. Their behavior from then on is going to be so different. You have freed them. You, you freed them to be different and to actually serve God in a much more powerful way. All right, see you in a few minutes. Thank you for your patience.